Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Family Seasons. That would be seasons in the family, things that happen in the family. And this particular lesson will be on seasons of parenting, those challenging times when the children show up. This is lesson number eight in our series for May 25 of 2019. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, some of us have tried to be fathers. Some of us are mothers. We know the challenges that that brings and uh, we're brave enough to try to discuss it today in this series. Be with our friends out there who will be watching in that uh, whatever we come up with under your inspiration will be a blessing is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we wish that every single child brought into this world was carefully planned for, but it didn't doesn't work out quite like that. But it certainly is true that every child born brings a big change into somebody's life. Well, think about some examples of parenting in the Bible. Adam and Eve, when they had their first child, Cain. Did God deliver the baby? Ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. Did anyone tie the cord? What did they think when they saw the placenta? They'd seen animals. Presumably, yeah. Um, Did God give them instruction about pregnancy, about birth, about child rearing? Or did he just leave them on their own to try to figure it out? Good question. (laughs) I'm sure they had a lot of instruction. I hope so. And think about Sarah. 90 years old, she says, I'm way past that business, and all of a sudden, she's a mother. Isaac, which means laughter. She was laughing, I'm sure. God could easily have given Sarah her son many years earlier, so why didn't he? Does he need to test our faith? Well, her womb was dead, and he resurrected her womb. But he could have given her a baby (laughs) when her womb was alive. But he likes death and resurrection better, I think. Oh, that's interesting. (laughs) If he did earlier, uh, some of the problems in the world would not be there. Yeah, exactly. And he he must have known what was coming. Yeah. There is no question, no question in my mind, about the fact that God chose in the Bible to control pregnancies at given times. Mm-hmm. I, I can, there's time when it says a certain king and his family in Gerar, none of his wives had any children. And then said, oh, it's because, you know, he had taken Sarah to be a wife. And said, get her out of here so my wives can go back to having children. Mm-hmm. Um, think about Hannah. Mm. But the times that I think of especially are times like Bathsheba had had been married for years to a man who was a military genius. I mean, he must have been virile and not a single child. And she has one sexual experience with David and bang, she's pregnant. But David took him, kept him away from her. Okay, well, look to back look back to Judah. Remember? His his daughter, or his sons, married that Canaanite woman. Tamar. Tamar. Tamar, yes. Tamar. Could not have any children. Didn't have any children. They died. God put them to death or whatever. And Judah finally, in that other experience, what happens? He has one, one experience time. with her and <laughs> babies. Now, if God didn't have anything to do with that, I don't know. Sounds kind of suspicious to me. <laughs> Seems like God has quite a sense of humor sometimes. <laughs> it does. I mean, really, when you think about it, how she fooled Judah. <laughs> yeah, right. 
Probably the most amazing story of that kind is the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Why would God choose a teenaged, unmarried woman living in a despised city to be his mother? I mean, can you imagine it? Was it because of who Mary was? If so, we need to talk about her parents and what kind of parenting skills they had, right? Or was he trying to make a statement about the environment? So no one could claim that Jesus, well, he, the reason he was good is because he had a lot of advantages. This must have been quite a shock to the family, to her parents, I mean, yeah. to everybody that all of a sudden she's pregnant. I mean, here's this woman that must have been, re she must have been respected oh, yeah. because of the kind of woman she was in the community. And yeah. What? She's no, pregnant? She's, she's pretty young, even. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't, doesn't mention her parents, though. So we, no, no we but knew. she must have had parents. That well, really originally, <laughs> but not necessarily the at the time. Yeah. All we know is the cousin, Elizabeth. Yeah. You know, that's all we know. Yeah, all but right. we also read somewhere that she could not be more than 14, 15, 16 mm -hmm. years old. I mean, what did she know? And what's amazing mm -hmm. is she marries this, well, God arranged it, right. marriages this man who already has somewhere so between six and eight children. Mm -hmm. And their oldest child must have been just about her age. Right. Mm -hmm. And now she's responsible for these kids. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fact, the fact that we know that Mary was educated somehow because yeah. she apparently taught Jesus how to read how to read and scriptures and so on. etc yes she had to have come from a educated family herself yeah especially and, and the considered. parents had to have concern for her yeah especially when you consider the fact that basically girls didn't get education in yeah. those days so she may have been one of the very few females that had education you know as young as she was she probably had children by Joseph after Jesus too well, there's pretty good reason to say that's not true because when really? Jesus on the cross said, John, please take care of Mary, that would be un oh, unthinkable that's, that's if she right. had other children. Yeah. So it's pretty true. sure that Jesus was the only child. Except that in the Mark chapter 4, it says, uh, your brother and sister said, this must have been half. Half brothers and sisters. And, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. and all older than Jesus. And all older, right. Yes. James, Judas... Yes, right, right. It does mm -hmm. mention. Right. Well, how should the church in our day relate to people who can't have their own biological or natural children? There are examples. Can you think of some examples in the Bible of people who couldn't seem to have children? Sure. Charles, I think you have an example there. Yeah. Let me read this. But Rachel had not born... Jacob any children and so she became jealous of her sister and said to Jacob give me children or I will die American wow. Bible Society in 1992 and think why why did God choose Elizabeth another woman way past childbearing age and her husband Zachariah to give birth to John the Baptist and the forerunner of Jesus they didn't have to be cousins. He could have chosen anybody to be a forerunner of Jesus. Did, did God want to if intentionally choose babies who are miraculously born to be the, the people who would be his, his, the Messiah and the, and the forerunner of the Messiah? Well, it did bring more attention, to, for, for instance, to John. The circumstances, you know, with uh, the Zacharias being mute, and uh, and then him the quibbling over who, what it was name going to be and everything, and so everybody was in the hills around there were buzzing about, you know, well, what's the, what's this child going to be? Because yeah. they prophesied also over the child. And Zechariah was one of the priestly. Who was a priest? Yeah. So this rumor, you know, had to be going around the temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so this lesson about having your own children is probably going to be a painful one for some who have wanted desperately to have some of their own children and never been able to. Should the church make a special effort to reach out to people like that? Um, some of these people choose to adopt children. I know some people have had wonderful success with adopted children. 
Are there many ways in which people can get involved with children? There are many ways people can get involved with children. So you can be a mentor, you can be a teacher, you can be a Sabbath school leader. Mm -hmm. There are a number of other activities where you can, even if you don't have your own children, you can be involved with children. And you can pick the age you like the best yes, when you do that. exactly. <laughs> Carrie, I think you have some words from Paul about marriage and not marriage and children. and Yes. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 10 and 17. Now, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it would be better for you to continue to live alone as I do. But if you cannot restrain your desires, go ahead and marry. It is better to marry than to burn with passion. <laughs> For married people I have a command which is not my own but the Lord's. A wife must not leave her husband. Each of you should go on living according to the Lord's gift to you, and as you were when God called you. This is the rule I teach in all churches. And this comes from the Good News Bible. Okay, and what's without having take? We don't have time to read the whole passage following that. Paul basically says, "We do this because of the nearness of the coming." Right. So now we're two thousand years later. Second Advent hasn't happened yet. Should we stop getting married? Stop having children? Some have thought that. Yeah. Now, in, in ch verse 35, he says, I say this for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. So that's another reason why he's saying this. He, yep. I want you to have undistracted devotion to the Lord, which is more important than uh, trying to struggle in a marriage that where you don't, if you don't have that. Now... It's it can be that you encourage one another so that you don't let, that you maintain that. But. Let, let's just stop for just a second. Let me ask a very serious question, and this question is addressed to you out there. In the world in which we live, is it a good idea to bring children into this world? I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, we got four kids. And yes, I do travel the world. I travel in this country as well. And um, uh, this is, I'm not joking. Uh, if I were to marry today... You might think differently. I w it's not um, I might think. Mm -hmm. I would not want to have any kids. Jesus, of course, never had children. Try to imagine what it would be like if some direct descendants of Jesus were alive in the world today. Would some people want to worship? <coughs> <coughs> yes. One thing I'm sure of, if there were some direct descendants of Jesus alive today and people knew that they were direct descendants of, of Jesus, the devil would make their life impossible because he would want them to be turn out to be wicked. So maybe there's a good reason why Jesus chose not to have. I mean, I'm sure there's more, more than one reason. Another significant issue that the church needs to deal with is the case of single parents. Often single parents are looked down on because it is assumed that they have been, they've given birth out of wedlock. But there are even biblical examples of times when that was not the case. Think, of course, of the story of Hagar. I mean, it, they thought they were doing God's will. During that three-and-a-half-year famine, Elijah was sent to Zarephath to help a single mother who was a widow. How would our church today relate to a prophet of God living with a widow and her son? <laughs> no problem, right? <laughs> Let's see, this is the uh, preacher, the single preacher yeah. living with, staying <laughs> with a single widow. woman, huh? No? Right. Yes. A widow. Yes. Yeah. Well, I picture an upper room where he stayed, and you they can stay picture down. what you like. I'm just saying, I'm, and I think that people do talk. <laughs> yeah. Whether there's anything going on or not, people talk. I I I like to think about that experience because eventually it got to a place where they were the only people in town who had any food. Mm -hmm. How would that make you think? I mean, here's this guy who just showed up from nowhere. And now he's living with this widow and her son, and somehow or other they're the only ones with food in town. I mean, and I'm, they're, they're, you know, 
you got to think about this. There's going to be, we're going to have fun talking about these stories when we get to heaven. When Jesus talks to God, tells us, you know, exactly what he did and why he did it. But, I mean, people must have come down. <laughs> but, <laughs> where, where, where are you, what are you eating? But he had to be well respected in that little town. We don't know. It might have been. Well, we have, to, we have to be careful because it's memory. We don't know. We, he lived just a few, he was, li he was staying just a few miles from Jezebel's father. The, her hometown was just a few miles from the place where he was hiding. Hiding. This was outside of Israel. Huh? Mm -hmm. Outside of Israel. And Jezebel and Ahab said, had told everybody, all the surrounding countries, you look for this guy and get him and send him back to us. And he was living right under Ethbaal, which is her father's name, right under Ethbaal's nose. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, it always <coughs> helps to go back to the scripture instead of just depending on your memory. And I, th I think it comes from this. When, she, uh, when the son died out in the field, he took him and carried him well, to the... That's a completely different story. story. I know. The, <laughs> Elijah. And, yeah. Yeah. In the but upper this, room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. So yeah. he was in an upper room. On he this wasn't a, in the same... No, no, no. That's not the same story at all. The story we're talking about was during the three and a half year famine that happened way earlier. This is later, the, the, the story of the... Um, what was the name oh, the, of the town? Mm, I've forgotten the name Zarephath, of the town. Zarephath. 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 Well, no, that's the story. That's what we're you have to about. keep Zarephath separate from, from the story you just read from. This uh, is the this place is where, where Elijah came and talked to the woman, and she said, please, she said to her husband, please, we need, this man is so special, we need to make a room for him. And the guy says, fine, we'll make a room for him. And then she said, finally, she said, man of God, couldn't you bless us somehow? What would you like? And he said, well... She said, we, we don't have any children. He said, well, okay. God will bring you children. By the time I come back next time, you'll have a child. Completely different story. But that's the reference you give. First Kings 17. It was the widow of Zarephath that had the son. and that he She was, was a widow. She Yeah, she was a widow. She wasn't the one. Right. She was not the one from... What's this the name of... This one had a husband... Mm -hmm. And the kid was out in the field. It says, my head, my head. That's not what we're talking about here. Well, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. No. Shunem. Yes, it is. Yeah. Shunem. Uh, it's the same chapter, 17. That'd be two stories then? But it's, it, the woman you're talking about is Zara, not Zarephath, um, Shulam. Shulamite. She was a Shulamite woman, not yeah. Zarephath. It's because of the First Kings 17, verse 9. He's oh, so the text is not. The it's the correct. text. I'm, I'm referring, the text. To, and that's in. He goes down to the Lord sends him to Zarephath, and there's uh, a widow there. Yeah, and that's what she I'm has about. a son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she has a son. But the story you're talking about. No, I'm. I'm just reading down through the same chapter. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, he, he was in the upper. He had an upper room. No? Where does it say that? Um, 19, verse yeah. 19. Uh, okay. Carried him up the room. Okay. Where okay. He to the room where he was staying. Okay. I, I stand corrected. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I did say that. I, but there is another story of yeah, the I, I Shulamite think. woman who built a place, a separate room for him. So I thought you were talking about that story. There was a story of the oil and meal that didn't run out. Yeah, yeah. this in Zarephath. That's where it starts yeah. there. Yeah. That's what we're talking about yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. So we just got the wrong text. In. How would our church relate to someone like that? Well, talk about, uh, let's talk about Mary. Okay, from the day, <clears throat> from the day that when she heard the angel's announcement in the home... At Nazareth, Mary had treasured every evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. His sweet, unselfish life assured her that he w could be no other than the sent of God. Yet, there came to her also doubts and disappointments, and she had longed for the time when his glory should be revealed. 
Death had separated her from Joseph, who had shared her knowledge of the mystery of the birth of Jesus. Now there was no one to whom she could confide her hopes and fears. The past two months had been very sorrowful. Now those are the two months when Jesus left Nazareth, went down, was baptized, went out in the wilderness and so forth. Go ahead. Yeah. She had been parted she had been parted from Jesus and whose sympathy she found comfort. She pondered upon the words of Simeon, A sword shall pierce through your own soul also Luke two thirty five. She recalled the three days of agony when she thought she she had lost Jesus forever, and with an anxious heart she awaited his return. And that was from, from Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page one forty five. Being a single parent has a lot of challenges. I don't think anybody who has observed or been through that experience would have any questions about that. They, re- they range from the financial responsibilities to managing all the other's various responsibilities, including trying to have enough time to sleep at night. The Bible is fully full of promises that apply even to single parents, and there's many of them. Uh, Jeremiah 31:25, Matthew 11:28. Come unto me and rest, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, and so forth. James, the older stepbrother of Jesus, wrote, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, James one twenty seven. How well is the Seventh-day Advent Church doing in reaching out to single parents, widows, and orphans? Surely it would be appropriate for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to welcome such people, no matter how they got into their situation, into church fellowship, and help them in whatever ways possible. There are many passages in Scripture celebrating the joys of parenting. For example, see Psalms 127, 3 to 5. And I quote, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a real blessing. The sons of a man who has when he is young are the sons a man has when he is young are like arrows in a soldier, soldier's, soldier's hand. Happy is the man who has many such arrows. He will never be defeated when he meets his enemies in the place of judgment. Wow. Sounds like everybody's supposed to be at war. Yeah. But we need to recognize that parenting is always a brand new experience. No child is exactly like any other child. I don't care how many children you have, each one is a new experience. Maybe because of their gender, maybe because of their birth order, maybe because of their natural tem- temperament, or any host of other reasons. Each child is special. Well, God gives instru- clear instructions to the children of Israel through Moses just before they entered the land of Canaan mm-hmm. about how they should instruct their children. Jim? Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Israel, remember this, the Lord, and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Never forget these commands that I am giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you are at home and when you are away, when you are resting and when you are working. Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. Wow. There are, very, there are four very important recommendations in Deuteronomy 6. First of all, we need to recognize the Lord as our God. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Then we need to love Him fully with our hearts. Verse 5. More than that, we need to practice Bible study and treasuring God's Word. Verse 6. We also need to find the most effective ways to share those attitudes and practices with our children. Verses 20 through 23. The instruction given there in Deuteronomy 6, and you remember that Deuteronomy 6 is part of one of the three sermons that Moses gave to the children of Israel They are camped on the plains of Moab next to the Jordan River looking across a flooded Jordan River at Jericho on the other side. And they could see it very clearly. I mean, it's two, three miles away, but the valley goes like this and the Jordan River is along the bottom and there it is. And that's that's where we're headed. And Moses is giving them clear instructions. Okay, this is the way you should live your lives when you cross that river. And it's not long before he Mm -hmm. dies. Climb to the top of Mount Nebo or Mount Pisgah, and uh, God buried him and took him to the better Canaan. So, 
the, this instruction in Deuteronomy 6 gives us two main important principles. We need to talk to our children about God. We need to teach them about God. So this, in, this involves two things, formal instruction and informal instruction. And both the formal and informal instruction, they need to understand our own relationship with God and why we think that this is the most important aspect of our lives. And when Jesus was tempted by Satan, he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6. Everyday events that happen to us can often be used as launching pads for teaching biblical principles. If we're good at it, we can think of biblical principles being taught of things that happen to us every day. The second main thing that we need to do as parents is the bind right principle. What do we mean by the bind right principle? Not bind R-I-G-H-T, but the bind W-R-I-T-E principle. Well, you remember what it says in Deuteronomy 6, 8, and 9? Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads. As a reminder, write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. And if you're a conservative, faithful Jew today, you will still do that. Exactly. If you stay in a hotel in Israel, if it's one of the ones that belongs to a conservative Jewish family, you look outside the door and there'll be a little thing at a 45 degree angle that has a passage of scripture right there. And you see when, them walking with the yeah. law on their foreheads and on their arms. And if you go to Jerusalem, to the western wall there, where they the most holy place for the Jews, if you're a male, you can go down there and they will show you how to do that, how to bind them to your forehead and to your arms. They'll give you instructions. Years ago, it was down on Fairfax Street down in L.A. <laughs> on a Sunday. <coughs> the guy with his phylacteries out there came up and was talking to them. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting because you start asking because some of the people come down there and they're all in black, yeah. and other people come down and they're all in white. You say, huh? I mean, these are these are people who are dressed like priests, but one some are all black and others white. So I I never got it all straight, but somehow or other the white people are are rejecting what the pe black ones teach, and the black ones apparently are rejecting what the white ones teach. <laughs> Uh, We're right. Pharisees and Sadducees. Oh, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, ideally we need to pass on to our children our love for God and our willingness to follow Him in all things. Um, I guess we have time for Genesis 18, 17, and 19. And the Lord said to Himself, I will not hide from Abraham what I'm going to do. Now, you remember this is a story of three dusty travelers walking along a road and they come by Abraham's tent. I'm sure it wasn't by accident. And Abraham rushes out. Oh, stop. Come in. Now, why do you suppose Abraham did that? It's custom of the Eastern yes. culture. Okay, that's part of it. it was what, what have you heard? Yeah, exactly. Bring me the news that you've heard. Exactly. This is the CNN of his day and the ABC <sighs> News and whatever. Where did you come from? What, what's going on there? Please... That's the only way we had, they had to get news in those days. So Abraham rushed out there and said, come on over. Now remember, this is the Abraham that's responsible for a thousand families that worked for him. You know? Families. Yes. A lot of people. Yes. So God says, his descendants will become great and mighty, a great and mighty nation, and through him I will bless all the nations. I will have chosen him in order that he may command his sons and his descendants to obey me and to do what is right. And just, if they do, I will do everything for him that I have promised. Then the Lord said to Abraham and reveals to him what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. And then you, for Samuel 3, in 10 to 14, I'm not going to take time to read that verse, but that's the time when God came down and spoke to Baby Samuel. Well, not baby, oh, yeah. I guess. Young Samuel, right? Yeah, when he was a boy. What a conflict. Two conflicting stories. Wow. So parents need to make good examples. They need to live as good examples. We, don't, we should not make the mistakes that Eli and Samuel did. And Jim, I think. Or is no, it Jackie? It's me. Dennis, okay. You're going to tell us about that? And I'll be reading... Genesis 18:17 17 to 19 again here. And the Lord said to himself, I will not hide from Abraham what I am going to do. His descendants will become a great and mighty nation, and through him I will bless all the nations. I have chosen him in order that he may command his sons and his descendants to obey me and to what it, 
uh, to do what is right and just. If they do, I will do everything for him that I have promised. Good News Bible. Wow. And then from uh, Education uh, 187.2, Ellen White says, God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. And that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families and not a few, but newly converted from heathenism. Wow. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Of Abraham, God said, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. Quoting from what we just read in Genesis 18:19. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom and tenderness that hearts were won. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, Genesis 18, 19. Does that give us a clue as to why he was chosen to be the father of the faithful? I can hardly imagine a person who had the power of personality and character to have a thousand people, a thousand families, somewhere close to a thousand families. Remember, it says there in Genesis when that time when they had to go and rescue Lot, he had 318, I think it was, trained soldiers to go out there and conduct war on his behalf. I mean, of course, these, I'm sure the rest of the time they were, they were guarding his flocks and herds, and that's what they did. Imagine, and, and people fresh out of heathenism, and, and they saw in him something that just attracted them. I've never seen that count be a thousand. Where did we get that? Oh, we just read it. Yeah. No. Ellen White. But in Scripture? Yeah. Oh, no. Ellen White is the one who comes up with it. Okay. so A household consisting of more than a thousand souls. Yeah, we read that. But yeah. Yeah. Many of them heads of households. We, right. Yeah. One question that arises when discussing the discipline and teaching of children is whether or not physical punishment is appropriate. (laughs) It has been said that a pat on the back may help people if it's applied soon enough, frequently enough, and low enough. (laughs) (laughs) And early enough, yeah. Oh, we should say, yeah, we should have said early enough, shouldn't we? I think it's early enough rather than soon enough. Okay. Early in their life. Good. They, they need to it. not re- remember some of it. They just know that you mean yeah. what you say. Okay. Does she say never discipline them in anger? Yes. I oh, think that's, she does. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Because if you discipline a child in anger, it just a, immediately responds. I mean, they'll respond in the same way. A rebel will come out. Yeah. One of the guys I was playing golf with today was telling me about a teacher that he had that gave him a paddling when he was about 13, oh. two different times. And he says, I grew up, and when I met that man in later life, I went up to him and said, I have such respect for you. I really realize now that I needed that at that time. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> well. He said that man was so, it was a teacher, and he yeah. says the man was so caring in the way he did it mm-hmm. that he felt like, a good father. Hmm. Yeah, well, obviously Abraham knew how to do that with adults. Yeah. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Just a guy you're playing golf with in yeah. conversation. Yeah. Rich shares it. Wow. Jackie, I think you had something about that. So Proverbs twenty two, fifteen. Children just naturally do silly, careless things, but a good spanking will teach them how to behave. Wow. Good news Bible. Proverbs twenty three 13 and 14. Don't hesitate to discipline children. A good spanking won't kill them. As a matter of fact, it may save their lives. And Proverbs 29, 15. Correction and discipline are good for children. If they have their own way, they will make their mothers ashamed of them. Okay. Wow. Pretty descriptive. I think the Bible study guide has something about that. Jim? The Bible teaches parents to govern with kindness, Ephesians 6, 4, and Colossians 3, 21. 
and to instruct children in righteousness. Psalms 78, point, or 78 verse 5, Proverbs 22, 6, Isaiah 38, 19, Joel 1, verse 3. As parents, we ought to provide for our children. Second Corinthians 12:14, and set a good example for them to follow. Genesis 18:19, Exodus 3:13:8, Titus 2:2. 2, 2. We are told to direct our households well. First Timothy 3:4, 5 and 12, and to discipline our children. Proverbs 29:15 and 17 while at the same time reflecting God's love, Isaiah 66, 13, Psalms 103, 13, Luke 11, 11. Adult Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, May 22nd. It's interesting to notice that the Bible, unlike other ancient literature, doesn't hesitate to point out the mistakes made even by saints. Isaac and Rebekah each had their favorite sons. Isaac preferred Esau because he'd come back with these wild stories of going out and catching animals and you know, bringing them home to make stew out of. And Rebecca preferred Jacob because he was quieter and he preferred to be around home. Unfortunately, Jacob, in turn, favored his son, Joseph. And we know what happened as a result of that. Although he was a spiritual leader of the entire nation, the priest Eli failed to correct his own sons, 1 Samuel three ten to 14 his adopted child, Samuel, turned out to be much better. And it's amazing to me that Samuel came out as good as he did under those circumstances. But Samuel himself made many of the same mistakes with his children. And the royal family of King David, oh boy, made a lot of mistakes. David himself committed adultery in order to murder to cover it up. I mean, what do you say to your children when that becomes known? everybody. Probably the wickedest king in that family line was King Manasseh who quote, and I'm, I'm quoting here, rebuilt the pagan places of worship, built altars for the worship of Baal, made in, in, an image of the goddess Asherah, and put it in the temple by the way, worshipped the stars, built altars in the temple, sacrificed his son as a burnt offering, practiced divination and magic and consulted fortune tellers and mediums, and placed the symbol of the goddess Asherah in the temple. That's just what I was talking about there in Jerusalem. You can read that all about that, Second Kings 21, 1 to 9. This is in Solomon's temple. In this Solomon's temple. Yep. Didn't realize it before. Wow. But not all in the Old Testament is bad news. Think about Job's 14 children. He had two sets of seven children each. Have you ever wondered what Job's second set of children will say to his first set of children when they get to heaven? Did the same wife have all those children? I assume. But they were already grown. Yes. The ones that were... Yes. <laughs> no, but this, this is... Are we looking at before the flood? No, no this, this is after Job, Job, we really... Do we really know about when Job... Um, Yet left? Well, well yeah, we don't. Moses, wasn't he? Well, not really. Mm -hmm. Moses wrote, but so this is looking around. back. It's yeah. more likely that Job lived about the time of Abraham. That's oh, what okay. the that's what many people think. I mean, the scholars think. Yeah. In light of the fact, because he talks about group, other groups of people that were around in the days of Abraham. Now, that's not positive proof, but uh, that's logic. probably around about the time of Abraham. Well. I, I'm the, I, they live I'm, long. They live yeah. long. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to be very interested to see what those children have to say to but us. They were good kids. They were good kids. As opposed and beautiful, to beautiful, the, by the way. Remember, his last three daughters were the best-looking ladies in the land. Mm-hmm. Well, Mordecai, the cousin of Esther, was a wonderful surrogate or adoptive father for her. But would you want your daughter to do what Esther did? <laughs> It's true that we, she saved her people at a time of crisis. However, as a faithful Jewish girl, she violated all the Jewish norms of, by marrying a heathen king. It's not just the Jewish norms. It's yes. all norms. Some other kinds of norms. But do, do you think Esther had any choice in the matter? She did, but through her actions, 
God's people were saved. Yes. If her, if her cousin hadn't done what he did, right. they might not have been in the crisis to start out with. <laughs> in spite. Yeah. In spite. Yeah. Excuse me, Ken. Yeah. Job had seven sons and three daughters. Oh, ten. Yes. I'm sorry. That's twice. The first batch. That's the yeah. first batch. Well, I think it said. Didn't that say the second thing about the same thing about the second batch? Verse four, chapter forty-two. Thank you for p clarifying that. Um, chapter forty-two. I should. Well, she's finding it. I think those girls were so beautiful that uh, they married their own brother. Did they? Did they not? I don't know. I don't think it says that. Where did you get that? Uh, my version. But yeah. the I, I, pastor's perspective today in the afternoon on my way home. Every afternoon there's a call-in show. Yeah, it and says f chapter 42, verse 13, again. The second batch of kids, seven sons and three daughters. Yeah, and it names the daughters. Mm -hmm, yes. It names the, it doesn't name the sons, but Very, it names very the special three, young ladies. It names the three daughters. Mm -hmm. Does it say anything whom they married? Or? And then they no, also yeah. got no. an inheritance. Inheritance. Yeah. So it wasn't just... No. A young person called in today and asked if uh, it was okay for Adam and Eve's children to marry each other. And the, the genes were pretty pure back then. Yep. And I thought the two pastors did a very good job in explaining how it was okay there. And that prohibition didn't come till later. So, but well, for those who want thinking. children and maybe can't manage to have their own biological children, there are various ways to be surrogate parents, mentors, teachers, or adoptive parents. Sometimes adoptive parents seem to do a better job than parents who have their own children. Earnest prayers are always appropriate when it comes to dealing with our children. Okay? We have Ellen, Ellen White from Signs of the Times, mm -hmm. July 22, 1889. You should take time to talk and pray with your little ones. And you should allow nothing to interrupt that season of communion with God and with your children. You can say to your visitors, God has given me a work to do, and I have no time for gossiping. Wow. You should feel that you have a work to do for time and for eternity. You owe your first duty to your children. Are we supposed to assume from that that any, any visitor who comes around is there to gossip? No, Hopefully I, not everyone, but I hope some, not. some might. Well, here she also says, and I quote, this is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1. Parents, you should commence your first lesson of discipline when your children are babes in your arms. Teach them to yield their will to yours. This can be done by bearing an even hand and manifesting firmness. Parents should have perfect control over their own spirits and with mildness and yet firmness bend the will of the child until it shall expect nothing else but to yield to their wishes. Parents do not commence in season. That means most parents don't start early enough. The first manifestation of temper is not subdued and the children grow stubborn, which increases with their growth and strengthens with their strength. Testimonies for Church, Volume 1, page 218. We had a conversation yeah. earlier about yes. this, about teach them, your children, to yield their will to yours. And my concerns about that, you know, I should teach my children to do their own thinking, not to just mm -hmm. yield to me. Some others had different comments. Um, well, well, it was only because of the babe in arms. Yeah. So I think we're seeing a different section of child development. In my mind, I'm thinking uh, literally infants up to three years. Yeah. That's the group that I'm thinking of. Samuel would have been very well trained by his mother. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not quite ready to do thinking. In fact, I've heard, I heard one parent say once, "Well, I'll just let them do what they want, and when they're old enough, then I oh can boy. talk to them Ooh. and reason with them." That's <laughs> it's like, too late. It's no, too late. and that's what she's saying here is that that's too late yeah. if you don't train their wills to to yield in in appropriate situations. Yeah. They will always be strong-willed and uh, be like well, we read in for sure somewhere we can, else. Yeah for, yeah, for sure we can say some things. Children need to be worked with 
and influenced as far as possible for the right, starting at a very young age. And even when children seem to go their own way and care little about God, we need to keep praying. It is impossible to know what event or influence might occur to convince those children to come back. I personally have had experience with a couple of individuals that uh, I won't say any more about who they were, as someone might recognize some of them, but people who went their own way for a while and I happened to come into the come in contact with them a certain way and now they're teaching in Adventist institutions. Are we talking about teenagers? No, I knew them as adults. Oh. Because because with this stuff all bets are off when they get to be teenagers cuz I've seen very good children and the teens happen and they just go Yeah. <laughs> Sure. But you're saying that if it was done right, even though they leave, That's right. they will. They come back. I, I, God's spirit will bring them back. Bring I, them back. I had the incredible experience of having conducting a Bible study in someone's home. There was a group, that, pretty good sized group, that came there on a regular basis, and somehow, just by chance, one of the people in that group was talking to someone who had actually said to her many years before, don't ever speak to me about God again or I will not talk to you again. And she somehow or other they mentioned something and she says, well, you ought to come to our house because we're having this Bible study here. And these people showed up for the Bible study. We were talking about the third angel's message. I mean, what a way to start. <laughs> and they never stopped coming. Amen. Uh, and they now teach. Took a little time. They now teach in one of our Adventist institutions. So you just and the reason I'm mentioning that you never know what wow. what you're going to do or what's going to what you're going to say or how it's going to happen. The good book says, "Train up a child in the way he yeah. must go. He might goof around, okay, but give it time, he's going to come back." Didn't God do a perfect job with this? Yeah. Yeah, All the did. angels. There you are. So oh, they're yeah. still free. Adam and Eve. <laughs> You're still free to choose the ro- destructive so path. One third of God's God's children rebelled. rebelled. That's the point. Hold on, just make. a minute. I'm still consider myself to be one of God's children, and so are one, you. Well, no, are you. One third of of His heavenly original, angels, original heavenly ch- children. Original okay. Children. Now I like that better. Rebelled. But All of God, us rebelled. If yeah. a third of the heavenly children did that. Do we expect to have any better results with humans? Wow. Well, you should keep you from being discouraged. You realize that yeah. if, if your kids make the wrong choice, they've still made a choice, and God will ultimately honor that choice. He can't force them to listen. Okay, so what does it mean to be a child of God? What should we learn from that image? Well, one... F- well, no... That's this this yours, I thought. No. Twenty-six. It's yours. Twenty-six. Okay. You mean my battery is dying, but we'll try the best. Let's there you see. go. Well, okay. W- one one father, soon after his children were born, said the following: "I've learned two great theological truths within the first few years after my children were born. The first." is the reality of free will. Uh (laughs) The second, the reality of sinful human nature. How much young people and children have taught his this own truth. How much young children have taught him this truth. Yeah. How do you suppose he learned that from his children? (laughs) His his wife worked the PM shift, and he had to put the kids to bed. And do all the do- <laughs> <laughs> That'll it's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's important to remember also that no matter how much you love your children, God loves them more. more. Amen. That's right. How can yes. we teach and show that lesson to our children? And your grandchildren. Yes. In many of the more affluent parts of the world, the Seventh-day Adventist Church would grow faster If we could just keep all of our children in the church, even if we did no evangelism outside of our families. So why are we losing so many of our children? Too many temptations elsewhere. If I had to answer, uh, I think the church has 
changed as a church we have changed in the last 30 years yes it's no longer the same as when i was growing up and of course uh, much more than 30 years old and that's the sad part and i think we should be able to say that said the lord my own experience the things were just fine till we put started to put our kids in the adventist school school wow. and uh, again i cannot blame the school i cannot i'm not going to but uh but anyways, yeah. uh, uh, well, and so the church, the family, the the school play a very important role, and we have got to support each other, support yeah. one another. So it turns out that the Adventist education was a her, tremendous blessing to me. Yes, same here. I was I was conducting Bible studies and Bible studies with other students when I was a senior in in high school and uh, academy boarding academy. So. It was just turned out to be a fantastic. Yeah, I would didn't get raised in a church, so somebody paid for me to go to Pine Springs Ranch really? when I was in junior high, and I gave my heart to the Jesus the very first time wow. around the campfire. Mm -hmm. Then cool. you go to church where the pastor, the people, they talk to you and introduce you to Jesus. Amen. Uh, and you fall in love with Jesus, that never goes away. Yeah. Well, at least Some, it somebody at, in church hurts you. And if you didn't know Jesus, you would never go back there again. Yeah. But you do know Jesus, so you go back. Uh, well, I, a lot of different things. I'm going to finish this last little bit. I just It's not the most important part of the lesson, but... Proverbs 22, 6. You know how it reads in most versions. I'll read you from my, my Good News Bible. They teach children how they should live and they will remember it all their lives. Let me see if I can get this thing to go back where it's supposed to be. Well, hold on here. I think I just lost it completely. Forgive me here. Just a second. We'll... Get things back here as soon as my computer wakes up. I'll go ahead and, yeah, thank you. Let me just use that copy. How do you understand that proverb, that passage? Many children, many have read it to mean that God has promised that if we are faithful parents, our children will remain faithful as well. Unfortunately, many parents have discovered that it doesn't always work like that. And the devil probably works extra hard on children of godly parents in order to somehow diminish their influence on others around them. So, um, Carrie, I Carrie. guess Carrie. Yes. What should a parent do when a child goes astray? Turn your children over to God in earnest prayer. If anybody understands your pain, it is God whose children by the billions have turned their backs on him, mm -hmm. the perfect parent. You can support your prodigals with love and prayer and be ready to stand alongside them as they wrestle with God. Amen. Don't, yeah. don't be, t uh, keep going. Mm -hmm. Don't be too embarrassed to ask for support and prayer. Don't blame yourself, and don't be so focused on the prodigal that you forget the rest of the family. Parenting a prodigal can divide your household. So, build a unified front with your spouse and set clear boundaries for your child. Remember that God loves your child more than you do. Look to a brighter future and accept that your child is God's work in progress. And that comes from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday. So now the question comes, how should that verse be translated? It's, it's probably the most frequently quoted verse about child rearing in the entire Bible. And yet it may not mean what a lot of people think it means. Um, there are several things that we can learn from this. First, first of all, no matter how one chooses to translate the verse, it does not mean that every wayward child is a result of bad parenting. What about the billions of God's children who have rejected him? We, we know about that. Proverbs are pithy statements. They are brief, forceful, and express strong sentiments. So this verse should be taken as a general principle about how Early experiences will not be forgotten or may have long-term consequences. We need to note some interesting points about the translation of that verse. In the... Um, hold on. Yeah. All right. 
in the uh, in the traditional translation, the expression "in the way he should go" does not really say that. The Hebrew only reads "according to his way." So, what does his his way mean? Is that a suggest to suggest that each person has a certain voca- vocational propensity, and that they should be encouraged to go in that direction? The author of the comment, the co- our commentary, suggested, "quote." The choice of a life's work should be in line with the natural bent. As the Bible Commentary, Volume 3, verse, uh, Volume 3, page 1020. Another issue is that the word translated child in the statement, in the standard translation, might actually refer to an unmarried young adult. Thus, some feel that the verse should read, train an adolescent in his own way, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. One medieval Jewish philosopher, Raubegs, which is an acronym for the Rabbi Levi Ben Gershom, uh, translated it, quote, Train a child according to his evil inclinations, and he will continue in his evil ways throughout his life. That sound like good biblical advice? <laughs> One might wonder why this, un- this understanding of the passage is not more fre- widely translated in the versions. It is probably because it does not sound like something the Bible should be promoting. And then... Margaret, I think All you right, compare Proverbs 19:27. Stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Okay. That's in uh, Gary D. Pra- Practical and Miles V. Van Pelt. They're basics of biblical Hebrew grammar. Okay. Uh, Gordon, could you read the next sentence in two till I sign my... There's one other very interesting variation of this verse that we should mention. A group of Jewish scribes and scholars known as the Masoretes, who preserved the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and copied it very carefully between 600 and 1000 AD, were very thorough and careful students of the Hebrew text and made another suggestion. It turns out that there were two ways to spell the word Enoch. There was one standard way the name Enoch was spelled and one shortened or defective way. Mm -hmm. That defective spelling is found in Genesis 25.4, 26.5. Numbers 26.5 and Proverbs 22, verse 6, which is our verse. So it is possible that in Proverbs 22.6, the author is trying to say something about Enoch and how he raised his son, Methuselah. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of coming together like this and talking about you and learning something from your word. We hope that you will give us guidance as we deal with our children and grandchildren and all those of all the people who are listening in as well as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.